him is by subjecting ourselves in obedience, loving obedience to his word. So, um, for this morning, this is Mother's Day, and we would like to extend our greeting to every mother and grandmother here this morning. I don't know exactly the origins of Mother's Day, who started uh, this tradition of Mother's Day, Father's Day, Grandparents Day, etc. I think it's Hallmark, somebody told me. I do not know exactly if that's true. But nonetheless, I think it is worth mentioning and recognizing that the efforts of our mothers, uh, they usually are not recognized all year round with all the labors that they go through for our sake, for our children's sake. So, uh, so I thought that for this particular occasion, we were supposed to have one more message in John chapter 21, but we will set that aside for next Sunday. A uh, very exciting portion of scripture after Peter uh, kind of backslid for a moment with the other six of them uh, and see how the Lord responds and deals with him at that particular time. But uh, we will reserve that for next Sunday and give a particular Sunday for a message for Mother's Day. We would like to recognize what the Bible has to say about this subject. So turn your Bibles with me, please, to the, the book of Proverbs, chapter 31. Proverbs 31 is our springboard text. Okay. And uh, we will read this responsibly. I think, I hope many of us are familiar with this portion, a description of the virtuous woman. But of course, we're applying it to all the women and particularly for mothers this morning. We shall be reading verses 10 down to 31. Shall we stand please to give God honor and to your reverence. Proverbs 31 verses 10 to 31. Who can find the virtuous woman for her prize as far about rubies? She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She considereth the field and buyeth it, and with the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. She stretches out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. She openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that, that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. 31. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Her Father, we come. thank you for this morning. Thank you for the privilege to be able to congregate freely and the liberties that we enjoy here that is fast eroding, if not totally gone, in other fields. So help us, Lord, to never take these privileges for granted. As we open your word, we ask your Holy Spirit to have his free course using your sharp edged sword to, to help us think straight, to allow us to submit to your authoritative word. Give us hearts that are submissive to your truth, to receive with meekness and grafted word, which is able to deliver or save our souls. So therefore, we pray like David to open our eyes, 
that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. We shall thank you for it, for the supreme Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right. We've entitled our message, A Mother's Worth, or The Value of Mothers. And uh, especially this being Mother's Day. And I hope uh, you have already given your greeting to your spouse, to your wife, or, or to your mother, grandmother, especially this day. Now, the Bible does say much about motherhood, and therefore I believe if there is one institution that should be talking, expounding, explaining, speaking out on the subject of motherhood, it ought to be the Bible-believing preaching church. Because the Bible is hardly being heard. The Bible is indeed the Word of God written by men who were moved by the Holy Spirit, and yet not very many open that book and check it out what it really says regarding how to get right with God, how to be saved, and how to live. And certainly, the aspect of the family and motherhood, the Bible is not silent about this subject. So today, being Mother's Day, it is but fitting that we direct our thoughts to the subject of motherhood for obvious reasons. I pointed out in our outline at least three of the many reasons why we should, I think, focus this morning and dedicate one whole service on this subject. First of all, the family is the basic unit of society. And therefore, you destroy the family, you ruin society. And it is therefore not surprising why Satan has his fiery darts targeted on distorting the role of the family or the family unit, for instance, by redefining marriage. There is so much lobbying and talk today in media, social media, television, and print media on trying to redefine marriage. The Constitution is very clear. Our jurisprudence is based on American jurisprudence. We would define marriage as a union between man and woman. There are been efforts being lobbied in Congress, in our Congress, that try to redefine marriage as a union between two partners in order to accommodate to the LGBTQ and uh, uh, agenda, in other words. So Satan is definitely at work in trying to destroy the family. And the Word of God is not silent on this subject. Bible believers need to know what the Bible has to say on this subject. It not only tries to redefine marriage, it also tries to ex extinguish love in the home. The Bible talks about the one of the marks of the end times as well as one of the characteristics of the pagan world in Romans 1.31 in 2 Timothy 3.3, 3, it talks about people will be without natural affection. What does that mean? The natural affection of a man is towards a woman and vice versa. So in the last days, as typical of the unsaved world, the uh, natural affection will be towards the same sex. The natural affection of a mother is to care for his children. And yet there are people today who have made every effort to legalize, especially in some, ter uh, in some developed countries like the United States, to legalize abortion. This is horrendous. This is diabolical, to say the least. This is demonic. And while it certainly is happening in our field, thankfully, by the grace of God, it is still not been uh, legalized by Congress. God forbid it, they would. And even if they did, the Church of Jesus Christ, the blood bought Church of Christ, should hold their ground on what God's Word says because the Bible is anchored on the truth of God's unchangeable character. And their people will never change. No wonder the Bible says the typical mark of unbelievers and the end times will be they will be without natural affection and unthankful, perhaps unthankful to parents. The New Testament also, uh, of all institutions in every generation, should be articulating what God's Word says on the subject of the family and motherhood. Why? Because it says in 1 Timothy 3.15 that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. And if the state would accommodate to the pressure of the world, of the pagan culture, of the postmodernistic mindset, 
of relativism that there are no absolutes. They will just go by what's popular and what's trendy. Therefore, our society is doomed. No wonder. They are all of these indicators, all of these are indicators of the Lord's any moment we turn. For third reason is, of course, the home is the pattern for local church ministry. And it is the divine laboratory to prove one's qualification for church leadership, whether that be the pastoral office or the office of a deacon. Turn me very quickly to 1 Timothy chapter 3. You see, some people have tried to compare the church and say the church should ought, ought to be run just like uh, an office. The pastor should serve as the chief executive officer. That is not what we find in the New Testament. Instead, the pattern for New Testament church ministry is the home. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We find the qualifications of a bishop. And it says in verses, uh, in, uh, excuse me, in verse 4 and 5, notice it says one of the qualifications of a bishop is one that rules well his own house. Having the children, his children gravity, uh, uh, children in subjection with all gravity. Notice the qualification is not his children are, are being ruled, but that the, the, the pastor should rule his house well, it says. It's one verse four, one that rules well his own house, having his children subjection in all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And that's the point I'm preaching to myself, myself as I'm preaching to you. Notice the qualifications of a deacon later on. First Timothy chapter uh, three, verses 11 and 12. Talking about the office of a deacon, even so must their wives be brave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. Now, I'm just declaring you what the Bible says. So we need to adjust and align ourselves according to this absolute biblical and pristine standard. Notice it talks about personal relationships in the home. First Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Rebuke not an elder, an elderly person, but entreat him as a father. And the younger men as brethren. The elder women as what? Mothers. The younger as sisters with all purity. Very clearly, the Bible makes it clear that the pattern for Christian ministry and the basic unit of society is the home. So in instances or occasions like this, we find this an opportunity to drive these truths home to God's people, especially in our church. Now, I have a, I have a three point outline here, and I'm going to give them all to you so that we can just flesh it out as we move on. First of all, we will look at a mother's influence articulated. A mother's influence articulated. Second, a mother's influence modeled. Modeled. And number three, a mother's influence valued. Valued. Okay, let's first take our first point. A mother's influence articulated. I think it goes without saying, it's a very basic truth that we all are aware of, but sometimes we don't state what is the obvious. The truth is, none of us exist without another person. We did not come into this life just like a bubble. And the talks Sigaw. All of us came from someone, and we all came from our mothers. And that's something that needs to be stated, although no matter how obvious that is. As elementary as this sounds, our begottenness is a reality. And it's easily lost to those who imagine that they are self-created. Sometimes when we grow up and our children grow up, they forget that they came from their mothers. They have no value. They don't see their parents or their mothers as having any value at all. No one is described as a characteristic of the unsaved world. 
No, it's just rip, it's a characteristic of the end times. Listen, when people grow up to be more mature people, we forget, sometimes we become very materialistic in our worldview that we forget we came from someone. The Bible makes it very clear. You see, <clears throat> from, from the very time before we were even born, we call this prenatal care. Somebody had to take care of us. And who else but mom took care of us. Learning to value motherhood means learning to value the role that mothering impulses play in forming, building, and defending our communities. From the very time we would conceive, there was mother already there taking care of us, feeding us, defending us. A typical, uh, a typical scenario. So at its most basic level, biological motherhood testifies to how women form a community. There is immediately a bond, a community, a relationship formed from the very time we were formed in the womb of our mom. See, a bond that between two people, two individuals living together as one. But a woman's instinct to protect and care for her community goes beyond bringing her children into the world. So make no mistake, let us all be reminded we came from somebody else. We came from our mothers. And that alone should make, make us appreciate and value. She had to bear us for nine months. In a pagan culture, when in some countries it is now legal or legitimate to curtail the life of your baby or that fetus simply because I want to, says a, mama, a mother. They even state that it is a right for a mother to choose whether to kill the baby or not. This is totally pagan, if not demonic. This is what the Bible says. It is demonic. Such a thinking is totally from the pits of hell. So then from, from, from prenatal care to birthing, the scripture calls us out, calls us to find the, to the kind of humility that the apostle Paul recognizes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Will you turn me there, please? 1 Corinthians 11. I hope we're all listening, regardless of our age, station in life. You may be a young a youngster. You may be a, a grade schooler. You may be a high schooler. You may be a college student. You may be a young professional. You may be a parent yourself or a grandparent. All of these passages are God's word for us all. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Notice it says, in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 11 and 12, nevertheless, Neither is the man without the woman. And neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man. Remember? In the Garden of Eden, God took the rib of Adam and he made that rib to be a woman, to be Eve. So as the woman came okay, without the man, or rather, uh, verse 12, as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. All of us came from our mother. I mean, God is the source of everything, but God designed that we come into this world through the process of nine month childbearing and birthing. So in discussing male and female dynamics in worship, <clears throat> the apostle Paul writes this passage in 1 Corinthians 11. And without this essential understanding, we lose the basis on which God commands us to honor our fathers and mothers. Honoring our parents is a humble acknowledgement that we did not make ourselves. Generations have come before us and he made our lives possible. We, did, we just did not spring out of nowhere. You say, Pastor, that's too obvious, we know that. And yet we do we think that way. And we behave that way when we retaliate. 
give no value to our parents. This is a real disease in society, and sadly, it is happening within professed Christian circles. So children, hearken the word of God. So from prenatal care to birthing and then to instruction. Did you not notice? I have been telling our, ch our young people, read the book of Proverbs. Read one chapter of the book of Proverbs a day and that will get you through the entire book of 31 chapters of Proverbs in one month. Adults, have you gone through that? I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but how many of us have read through the entire book of Proverbs? Very practical, short, pithy sayings on how to conduct our life wisely in this life. It talks about wisdom outside the worship service. Wisdom, how to walk appropriately and wisely outside the doors of the church. How to walk in relating to the opposite sex. How to walk and conduct our life properly. Uh, not only towards the opposite sex, but in our workplace. How not to be lazy, and so on and so forth. Very practical wisdom. And I really suggest, if you have not done so, listen. Read the book of Proverbs. One chapter a day will get you through the entire book in once a month. Very practical wisdom. Don't forfeit yourself of the blessing of not reading it. Why well, no, am I introducing the book of Proverbs? Because it is interesting. Turn me to the book of Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. The book of Proverbs begins... Notice carefully with chapter 1 and verse 8 and 9. Well, it says, the, the verse 7 is 16. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Why? For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Anybody can read. We'll see exactly what the text is saying. The book of Proverbs begins with the importance of hearkening the voice of our parents, our father and our mother. And how does it end? Turn me to the book of Proverbs chapter 31. Chapter 31. What does it say in verse 1? It comes from the word, the inspired pen of a certain king. This time it's not Solomon. It says in verse 1, the words of King Lemuel. Notice carefully the prophecy that his mother taught him. Did you notice that? The prophecy that his mother, who? His mother, the mother of who? The king! And he got this wisdom from the mom. You know, the, the, the tribe's a very clear point here. And I'm getting to be very emphatic here for the simple reason that I'm seeing this more and more prevalent in society and even in professed Christian circles. Something is happening in the homes of even Christians. They are forgetting that the anchor or belief and behavior ought to be the Word of God. The book of Proverbs makes it very plain. The writers of the book of Proverbs moved by the Holy Spirit makes it very plain. The degree to which we dismiss the teaching of our mothers is the degree to which we are foolish people. You want to see a person is serious about his faith? Then he will never despise or dishonor his mother or his father. Mark that well. I have the authority of the Word of God according to Scripture. So don't you say that you are living for God while despising your parents. You're going against the very vein of the text of the Word of God. Don't you ever place yourself about the authority of God's Word. Who are you anyway? Very clear. The influence 
influence of a mother is all over written in the pages of Scripture, all the New Testament. So this Mother's Day, children, adults, honor your father and mother, your mom. And don't limit it to Mother's Day. It is a command that has to be done all year round. Let's note a mother's influence model. Let's see this fleshed out incarnate in the lives of some great men, women of God, Old and New Testament. I'm citing one Old Testament example. Mature women have many things to teach us. We've seen it in the book of Proverbs. And not only to their biological children, but also to the church and society at large. So listen, children, don't you ever turn them up. But this is how they do it in the other house. So what? Do you know why you cannot do certain things? And you cannot just pattern your lifestyle after the, what other houses are doing? Because you are special to your mom. And your mom doesn't like to be like them. So listen to what the book of, Robert, the book of Judges. Turn to me to the book of Judges, chapter 4. I'm going to introduce you an Old Testament character whose name is Deborah. She was a judge. In the days of the day, uh, of the book of Judges, and if you ever recall the book of Judges, relativism was the rule of the day. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There were no absolutes. People were living according to their whim, their own caprice. Sad plight, sad condition, spiritual state of a privileged nation called the nation of Israel. God gave them the law, and yet they were living according to that which was right in their own eyes. And the book of Proverbs tells us there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is the way of death, Proverbs 14, 12. But thankfully there were, there were people, judges, God raised in such a chaotic society in the nation of Israel during that time. One of them was a woman. Her name was Deborah. Judges chapter 4 and 5. Joshua Judges. And in chapter 4 and 5, we have the story of Deborah. <clears throat> and we were told of Deborah. Deborah held a court. She was one of the judges in the Old Testament Israel. And she had a court. And we think of a court, we're thinking of, uh, you know, the, or the courts of law that we think of in our in, you know, like the regional trial courts or the municipal trial courts of our, of, uh, of, of our municipalities. Where did Deborah hold her court? Notice in chapter 4, verse 5. It says, And Deborah, I'm reading verse 4, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged, judged Israel at that time, verse 5, and she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah. In other words, there was a palm tree. Is that an example? Okay. There's a palm tree. It's called the palm tree of Deborah. And Deborah stayed there. It was between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. People of Israel would go to Deborah, a woman and ask her for wisdom and judgment under a palm tree. Doesn't sound sophisticated. Doesn't sound like a real court. But she was instrumental in providing judgment in a time when relativism was the rule of the day. What a godly woman. And what is interesting here is eventually there was a battle that would take place and she summons the military leader named Barak. Tells him that he must confront the enemies of Israel to restore peace and the future of the nations. See, even in the Old Testament times, women had a vital role to play to provide wisdom and stability in society. Interesting also, notice in chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, when they sang later, of the victory that God gave them over their enemies, notice how they composed their song. 
Deborah frames her role as that of a mother. Judges chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. It is where we read, In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anah, in the days of Jah, this is a song, and the, and the highways were unoccupied, and the travelers walked through byways, the inhabitants of villages seized, and they seized in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose, and that I rose, did you notice, as a mother in Israel. The inspired writer recognizes the role of Deborah and recognized her as a mother in Israel. Now, can you see? Do you see the point? You see how the Holy Spirit of God saw the vital role of a mother in among God's people, in the community, in the church, and especially in the home. Turn me to the book of 1st Timothy. Let's go to the New Testament example. 1st Timothy chapter 5. Uh, we already read this portion of scripture earlier where the Apostle Paul instructs the believers in the local New Testament church, particularly to Timothy. Timothy was passing the church in Ephesus and Timothy was being instructed how to conduct affairs in the local church. We need to learn from this. Again, I'm reading verses 1 and 2. Rebuke that an elder so don't, don't, don't rebuke Brother Vaughn as if you were an equal. As an elder guy, you should treat him as your father. Okay. Who else is look like an elder here? Uh, Brother Frank? Take your pass. <laughs> but rebuke that an elder, but then treat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, verse 2, the elder women you treat them as mothers. Don't you better call, don't you call uh, Mrs. Johnson Lucy. Treat her as your mom. Or Ate as, you know, as mothers. It says, and the younger as sisters with all purity. So notice, they're, they're to treat them as mothers. Again, Paul saying, Listen, the pattern for local New Testament ministry is the home. But having stated that, <clears throat> notice, aside from telling Timothy to respect older women as mothers, Paul also reminds him who were the first witnesses of the gospel to him. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Who was the first one who opened up the gospel to Timothy? Chapter 1 of 2 Timothy verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned, that word unfeigned means it's genuine. When I call to remembrance the genuine, authentic, unfeigned faith that is in you, Timothy, which was dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Two women mentioned specifically. Lois and Eunice. Grandmother Lois and mother Eunice. What a blessing they were because they were instrumental in exposing young Timothy to the gospel. Mothers, grandmothers, what a blessing. You can be a blessing to your home by being the instrument of bringing the gospel to your children and grandchildren. Ministry is not all local church. Yes, it is local church, but there is ministry in the home, even outside the local church. And it is also quite noticeable. Turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 16. Here is a narrative of the first 30 years of the Christian church. Luke, the human author, is narrating to us what happened during the first 30 years during its pioneering stages of the Christian church. And when he comes to chapter 16, narrating the growth of the church, let me read you verse 4 verses. Then came he, Paul, to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there, whose name was Timothy, or Timotheus. He was, notice, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek. His father was probably an unbeliever. But despite that, he was a godly Jewess. Luke does not 
leave her out in his narrative. Apparently, Luke recognized the role of, of Eunice in the life of Timothy. And, 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 he, and he continues his narrative, notice in verse 2, and he, referring to Timothy, he was well reported by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him, Timothy, would Paul have to go forth with him to, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And notice verse 4, when Timothy comes into the scene and as they went through uh, the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep and that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. You see the point of Luke? Luke says, you know what, Timothy came into the scene, the church grew. The churches grew up, grew in number, increased in number daily. What an asset Timothy was. And the inspired writer did not discount the influence of a godly man such as he is. Amazing. So what does it say? What do these passages say? We must therefore understand that the role that God is calling matured godly women to play. You women have a role to play in restoring and strengthening the church and in the broader community. Right now, Thus, the Bible-believing church is struggling to find its way. God is raising up mothers in Israel, Loises and Eunices, to help rebuild and restore our congregations. We recognize the unique and irreplaceable work that God is doing through such women. And these women are more than worthy of our praise than, than just honoring them on Mother's Day alone. What a blessing godly women are. And I'm praying God will raise up more Loises and Eunices in this congregation. You have a burden. God has seen, ladies, God has seen your shoulders broad enough to assume such an awesome responsibility. That's why it's such a blessing to hear those ladies sing this morning. All these mothers and mothers-to-be, perhaps some of them are mothers-to-be, singing, I love you, Lord. I want to serve you with all my heart. And that should be the prayer of every one of us, and especially ladies, mothers, and mothers to me. What a role we have to, what a vital role. Of course, sometimes we kind of joke it a little bit, you know, husbands are the head of the wives, but the wives are those who control the men. They're the next who control the head. That's kind of a joke, and sometimes there's truth to that, but sadly, but let's put it properly and be more serious about it. Ladies, you have a vital role to play for the church. See, your children, your grandchildren, are they saved? Are they walking with God? Your influence is vital in shaping their thinking and their life. Don't give it up. God placed you there for that purpose. And if you don't use that influence for that purpose, then somebody's influence will influence your children. And it's probably going to be the MTV. It's going to be their peers, the Barkadas, but it's not going to be the influence that you would like that will come from the influence of the Word of God. So in other words, we must recognize, ladies, your divinely appointed place in ministry Turn to me to first, or in First Timothy. Turn back to First Timothy. Now I realize, and especially in this day, for the last 20, 30 years, there has been a boom of so many ministries, and they are being run by pastors who are women. But we have to recognize the authority of Scripture in our ministry, in our life, in our conduct. And the Bible is very clear on this subject. I don't care what other ministries and mega churches say around us. This is the thus saith the Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Tell this following verses 11 to 14. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. This is talking about how the local church should be run. I suffer not a woman, verse 12, to teach. 
nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. The woman is not allowed to be occupying the teaching office. They are never to be the pastors of the church. This is the word of the word of God. And yet we have people, even Christians in fundamental circles, who are looking, listening to people like Joyce Mayer. And she's a heretic. She believes in the, in the you can be God doctrine. But because she's a popular pre preacher, people listen, even professing Christians do. In spite of the fact it's contrary to the word of God. Let me read it again. I suffer not, verse 12, a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence. Women's role is subject to the role, to the lead leadership of the man according to scripture. They are not to occupy the teaching of That doesn't mean you can, they cannot teach algebra in school. This is talking about local church ministry. This is the, what the text of scripture is saying. Paul's focus here is the public worship of the church. God has established a clear chain of authority in both home and in the church. And in both the home and in the church, God designed that the men would be the head. There's a chain of responsibility. I don't want to use the chain of command phrase. Because when you use the chain of command phrase, that, that somehow gives you an impression of a barking sergeant, the husband is giving orders to the wife. You follow, you follow, you. That's not the picture of scripture. There's a chain of responsibility. And the chain of responsibility, the whole, whatever happens in the home and in the church is the ultimate responsibility of the husband and the pastor. That doesn't mean women, women cannot teach. They can teach children, fellow women, but not the teaching office, the pastor of the world. This is God's word. <clears throat> so God has ordained that men are the head, not the barking sergeant, but they are the ones responsible. That is, they have the place of authority and responsibility. It also does not mean that every, by the way, this is very clearly, it does not mean that every woman in the church is under the authority of every man. Some churches have fallen into that snare. And some have taken advantage, some men have taken advantage. All women are under us? No. You're under your husband. The teaching office is the pastorate and the women, the women has a subordinate role in the local church ministry. So it doesn't mean that every woman and every woman in the church is under the authority of every man in the church. Not so. Instead, it means that those who head the church, the pastors and the ruling elders, must be men. And the women and others must respect their authority and their responsibility. And the, the Bible gives us the reasons. Verse 13, because there's a divine order in creation. It says, for Adam was first formed. Second reason, there is a distinction or a difference in their offense. It says in verse 14, Adam was not deceived. It was the woman who was being deceived in the transgression. Adam knew exactly what should be done. He got the instructions from God himself. Eve did not hear that directly from God. He just heard it from Adam. And sadly, he entertained the voice of the devil. So Eve was deceived, not Adam. Kind of indicates the vulnerability of women in local church ministry, especially the teaching office. That's why women are not supposed to occupy the teaching office or the pastoral office. <clears throat> so there's a difference in their offense. And then it says in verse 15, notwithstanding, she, the woman, shall be sa saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, admittedly, this is one of the more difficult passages of Scripture to interpret. But what did Paul mean by that in its context? Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. Does it mean that every woman who, does, who submits to the husband and to the pastor will be saved in childbearing? She will always be spared and always live? What about those women who died in childbearing? 
I don't think that's what the passage is saying. Does this mean that she shall be saved in childbearing? In other words, uh, they will no, not go to hell if they give birth? That's not what the passage is always saying. People are not saved by childbearing. They're saved by putting their trust in Christ as Savior. So what could possibly Paul mean by saying this? She shall be saved in childbearing. Perhaps a better way to approach this passage is based on the grammar of the original Greek text. In the original, it basically says this. She shall be saved in, there's a definitive article, the. She shall be saved in the childbirth. So therefore, what is the childbirth? See, the childbirth. So in other words, the sense here, it seems, is that she shall be saved when it comes to the childbirth that is predicted in Genesis. It was Paul, not Paul, Adam, talking about Adam and Eve. <clears throat> the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. The serpent shall bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. So he's talking about the seed of the woman at the childbirth. There's a coming Savior. The childbirth is referring to the coming of Jesus Christ. And therefore the sense is even though women were deceived and fell into the transgression starting with Eve, women can be saved through the childbirth of Jesus Christ with the Messiah when a woman brought, into the, brought the Messiah into the world. In other words, what is it saying? Probably the idea here is that even though the woman was responsible in first bringing sin, did you notice Romans 5.12, it says, by one man sin entered into the world, command responsibility. Eve sinned first, but God held Adam responsible. And while the woman was the one who first sinned in the transgression, the woman was the one instrumental in bringing the Savior into the world. She shall be saved in child bearing, bearing to bring the Messiah into the world. So the summary is this. Don't blame women for the fall because the Bible does not blame the women. The Bible does not. Instead, thank women for bringing, for being instrumental in bringing the Messiah into the world. And to such women who have made themselves usable for God, we rise up our, our, who, uh, as their children would call them, they would be called blessed. And therefore may we join with the writer of Proverbs, many daughters have done virtually, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Remember, favor is deceitful, beauty is vain. Okay. Sometimes women spend all their money in cosmetics. And I'm not saying you should not use cosmetics. I've joked that sometimes I think some women sin if they don't use cosmetics. Okay. I mean, I say that facetiously. But the point of the passage of the book of Proverbs, beauty is vain. It's going to pass. But the woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. So give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Praise God for godly women. Praise God for Deborah's, for Lois's and Eunice's, even in our church. We want to honor them today. But let me close by pointing out a mother's influence value. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. The first three verses we read, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first command with the promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on so notice, obey. That word is an imperative present tense. Meaning, children, keep on obeying. You don't say, I already obeyed. Mama told me to throw the trash. That was now. No. Continual present tense. Keep on obeying your parents in the Lord. 
The word obey means to hearken under a command. And the motivation is to be done in the Lord, meaning we do it for His sake. The reason? Because this is the right thing. That's what the Bible says. This is right. And then it says, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. What does that mean? You know what the word honor means? It's the Greek word timao, which means what? Honor means give value. You think you're giving value to your mom when you curse her? Giving value to your mom when you despise her, when you neglect her? Give value. Honor your father and mother. Give them value. The word of God says so. Honor your parents may change as we grow into adulthood, of course. Because when we go into adulthood, we have our own minds, we have to make decisions of our own, but the principle always endures. We may, uh, the years of obedience may change, but the principle of honor will endure. An adult may owe his parents obedience, or may not owe his parents obedience, but he or she owes her parents and her mom honor. Keep honoring her. The quotation from Deuteronomy 5.16, it says, it is a promise. It is a command with a promise. It's quoted from Deuteronomy 5.16. And that's an Old Testament passage, God telling the nation of Israel that if you obey me, I will let you dwell in the promised land. It's the land flowing milk and honey. It's a place of abundance and blessing. If you disobey me, I will curse you and I will scatter you. And that's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. They become stubborn and obstinate. God allowed them to be kicked out of the promised land. To be dispersed in other parts of the world under slavery of the Gentiles. So when, when Paul quotes that passage, it is a promise. It is a commandment with a promise. And what is the promise? It says that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest live long on the earth. For the Jew it means to be living long in the promised land, in the land flowing little honey. And for the Christian New Testament church, it means to be obedient your best to be in the place of blessing. God will bless you. Is what the passage is saying. It's to be in the place of abundance, in the place of blessing. David does it, I quote him by saying, Christians have normally divided the Ten Commandments into first four and six. In the Roman Catholic uh, dogma, uh, the Ten Commandments, first three, last seven. Why? Because they removed the Second Commandment. You should not make any graven image. So it was narrowed down to three and then the Seventh Commandment. If they removed one commandment, how can they still have ten? It's because they break the break broke down the last commandment. The last commandment is is uh, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. They broke it down into commandment numbers 9 and 10. That's Roman Catholicism. They have twisted the word of God. In many Protestant circles, the breakdown of the Ten Commandments, the first four, and then five to ten, four and six. And they place honor thy father and mother into the second tablet. Because they say that's to do with relationships with people. The first part to do with my obligation to God, and the second part that has to do with my obligations to men, that includes my parents. Did you know? And I'm quoting again Guzik, Christians have normally divided the Ten Commandments into first four directed towards God and last six directed towards fellow men. But did you know that the Jews divided the commandments into two sets of five? Which means they have placed the honor of father and mother as part of the first tablet. It's an obligation to God, in other words. Seeing that the law to honor your father and mother more as a duty towards God rather than a duty towards man. So in case you didn't know that, for your information, honoring father and mother is an obligation we have towards God. Let me not forget that. And not see how this is how important this is to God. Okay, very quickly, turn to Exodus 21, verse 15. 
And I'm going to close with this. Do you realize how important this is to God? Of course, this is the theocracy. I'm looking at the passage of the law. Under the theocracy, do you know that there are specific stipulations and penalties for disobeying the commandment of God? Exodus 21, verse 15. The Bible says, He that smites his father or his mother, he shall surely be put to death. You smite your mother, smite your father, under the theocracy, it's the death penalty. That's how serious it is to God. Of course, we're not living under the theocracy. We have our own complex. We are not a theocracy, we are a democracy. So we have our three branches of government. But I'm citing these passages to help us see how serious this a sin is a sin, how serious is dishonoring God by dishonoring our parents. It's a serious sin to God. It deserves the death penalty. Let's show another verse. See, death for physically, verbally, or non-verbally blowing our parents. Exodus 21, 17. He that curseth his father or his mother. What does it say next? Shall surely be put to death. Don't you curse your mom or your dad. Because that's the death penalty. You have a lot of words to eat. Perhaps it's the day of telling your mom, Mom, I'm really sorry. Let me show you another verse. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 21, 18. So death penalty for those who dishonor their parents or despise them or bring contempt to them. Deuteronomy 21, verse 18. And I'm going to close with this. If a man have a stubborn and a rebellious son, or daughter, in other words, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, but and after chastening him, he will not hearken unto them. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, bring him in, bring him out unto the elders of his city, and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This is our son, is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. And so shalt thou put away evil. Put, away, put evil away from among you. And all Israel shall hear and fear. Dishonoring parents is a serious sin before God. Thankfully, we're not under the theocracy, aren't we? Or how many of us would have been executed? So this Mother's Day, and let it be all year round. You're a Christian. You love Jesus Christ. You meant every word that you sung, ladies. You love the song. Those of us who are listening, you say you love Jesus Christ. Then don't say you love Christ if you despise your mother or your father. You are a hypocrite if you do so. God help us. There is forgiveness at the full cross of Calvary, the cleansing blood that can wash away our sins. Hopefully if there are set matters to settle, that we will settle with them. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you, your word is crystal clear but we've never taken the time to read it or study it, much less obey it. I pray let your spirit speak to our hearts and to those who are listening or will listen to this message. Let the truth of your word be heard and help people to respond, not to the voice of this preacher, but to the voice of the Holy Spirit who speaks to us in the pages of the inspired text because it is indeed the truth of the word. 
So by all the heads are about a nice close. No one looking around see Pastor Craig and God spoke to my heart. I am a Christian and I know it. I have trusted in Christ as my Savior. But I have never really thought about the value of my mom. I never really thought about giving to them value, honoring them. I have, in a sense, dishonored them. I've never really given them value. I've never seen their worth the way the Bible emphasizes. So I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will put things in proper perspective for us. This Mother's Day, let it be all year round towards your mom, grandma, your parents. Perhaps this is an area God needed the message you need to you needed to hear. You need to get right with God. Maybe repent of your sin ask cleansing of the blood of Christ. And perhaps this is the time you need to talk to your dad or your mom, especially and say, Mom, I'm sorry. I really am. This is a sin against God. If you have despised and dishonored your mom, then get right with her. And you know that step will really be one way of honoring her. Because God says so. So Pastor, pray for me. God spoke to my heart. I need to get right with God about this issue. Maybe God spoke to your heart. I'd like to pray for you. Would you sing the ratio in anybody? God's, anybody? God's, what well, had head bowed, eyes closed. God spoke to your heart. The pastor prayed me. God spoke to my heart. I never thought, I've never seen the perspective of the value of my mother or my parents the way it's been presented this morning. So I want to swallow this. I want to absorb it. I want to let it sink and shape my value system. <clears throat> From the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament, I want to be an obedient child of God by honoring my parents as well. That doesn't mean your years of obedience will stay, but your years of honor will have to endure. If that's your prayer, that's my prayer for myself and family. I hope that's your prayer too. Would you see me raise your hand? I'd like to pray for you. Anyone? Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Others more. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Others more. Pray for me, Pastor. God spoke to me. Anybody else? And perhaps you may have, maybe you don't have issues to settle. But you say, well, when God spoke, I have to honor my parents. I have to honor my mom. And would you, would you give them value? We'd like to pray for you. Would you simply raise your hand? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Give them value. The Bible says so. Anybody else? We'd like to pray for you. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Yes, sir. God bless you. Others more before we close. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you for your word. The entrance of it gives light. This is a lamp to our feet, light to our And Father, I really am convinced that this is a much needed message in our day. So speak to our hearts. Use this message to speak to the hearts of those who need to hear it. So that despite the relativism of our culture, despite the redefining of marriage and the lack of love in our homes, that is so pervasive in any homes, even professing Christian circles, Lord, we pray, let us, help us by your name, especially for those who raise their hands, myself together with all the others, help us get our values in line with your word according to the scriptures. We confess the many sins we have failed you in this area. We thank you for the blood that has been shed for the cleansing of our sins. And I pray if there's need for steps of restitution, may we so do it in obedience to you as an expression of a genuine repentance and as a step of heeding your word by honoring our parents, particularly in this case, your mom's. And we shall thank you for it for this we pray in Jesus' name.